it is my pleasure to introduce Catherine Laws, who came with a grand piano. Catherine is going to present until, under the title of This Is, Is It? And the presentation addresses tensions between distinctness and generalizability, or specificity and usefulness in artistic research to a performance piece, player piano, that interrogates musical agency and subjectivities. Catherine is a musicologist and pianist. She is a senior lecturer in music at the University of York in Great Britain and a senior artistic research fellow at the Orpheus Institute in Vienna. As a performer, Catherine specializes in contemporary music, working collaboratively with composers and often drawing other artists, especially for theater and film makers, into her project. Her artistic research focuses variously on processes of embodiment, subjectivity, and collaboration in contemporary performance practices. Welcome, Catherine.
practices decreases. But many of the key questions remain about the forms of knowledge experienced and communicated in and through performance practices, about creativity and agency, and about the relationship between the specific practice and wider relevance. Performance is, on one level, always a matter of emergent, enacted identity. When the authority of artistic work is shared, such as between composers and performers, agency and identity formation is always already complex. And identity is always produced through an embodied interaction with materials and tools, and in relation to specific spaces and contexts, of course. But this is still relatively little considered in the field of music performance, though those working in improvisation and especially the intercultural modes of performance produce an important work. I want to argue that there are ways in which music performance has specific things to offer the field of artistic research, in part because of the very ambiguity of agency, the distributed intersubjectivity, and the embodied staging of the critical uncertainty, the undecidability of meaning that has perhaps today led to its remaining somewhat in the shadows. In doing so, I want to consider the relationship between bodies and instruments in a specific cornered context of performance in action and suggest something of what thinking through practice or sometimes through musical practicing can expose. I'm getting waved at. Is it too... Am I too fast? Yeah. I'm always too fast. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll slow down. I'm conscious that we've started late and I've been told I've got to finish. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Musical performers do not explicitly play a role or character, except in opera or music theatre. But music is striking in its ability to carry subjectivity without the specifics of character. Naomi Cumming considers the ways in which the production of a particular musical tone, through a well-balanced physical adjustment of the instrument, is central to creating the impression of a musical persona. It's linked to the idea of a performer's voice, or in Cummings' terms, a sonic self, but created differentially each time. You don't just perform a self, but the event is performative of selfhood. But of course this is an embodied voice. More specifically, musicians work in gradations of tone, and for the performer there is, as Dobbins and Dak puts it, an experiential continuity between tone colour and gesture. Certainly for me, sound production is at the heart of piano playing. My sense of myself as a performer with perhaps something to say is deeply bound to the embodied experience, to tone, timbre, resonance, and to touch. But nevertheless, that apparently individuated embodied sonic self is social. As musical performers, our attention to the sounds we individually produce and how we produce them is formed collaboratively and differentially. A sound, style, or performance persona is developed through a process of identification with and differentiation from playing others, peers, teachers, idolized performers, past and present. Or come to feel my own, my sound, my sense of my body at the instrument, my something to say, is developed through process of teaching cultural practice and listening based on mimicry, repetition, comparison, and deviation. It's developed and received socially, as Philip Hauslander writes, to be a musician is to perform an identity in a social realm. This too manifests through touch. We know now how important a part touch plays in brain formation and in the development of a sense of self. But this individuation develops through interaction. Erin Manning notes that the surface of the body is a thinking, feeling surface. But as neuroscientist David Linden comments, we use touch socially to soothe, reconcile, form alliances, reward cooperative actions, and reinforce bonds of kinship and friendship. Pianists know that on one level, as Charles Rosen says, there's nothing we can do with the piano except play louder and softer, faster and slower. A single note cannot be played more or less beautifully, only more or less forty on piano, louder and soft, longer and shorter, apparently. Nevertheless, we work endlessly to refine those characteristics relatively so that differentiations of weight and touch become sonically, structurally and expressively meaningful 
and also come to feel significant and refine touch experientially, but also comparatively in relation to others through talk about it, demonstrating, experimenting, listening, and feeling. But what's the role of the piano here? This is part of a bigger question about the nature and agency of tools in art making. But I'd argue that the piano occupies a particular place in the consideration of the interaction between performer and instrument. In much of the literature on the relationship between the musician's body and her instrument, there's a blurring between ideas of bodily extension and incorporation or even prosthesis. Helena de Presta and Manus Securis consider the distinction between the ways in which prosthetic limbs replace or substitute their incorporation into the body schema, resulting in a feeling of bodily completion. In contrast with tools, a musical instrument will be included here, which extend the body into, their world, into the world, their use changing our motor and perceptual capacities, but without changing our sense of body ownership. A good artistic example, which many people recognise, but perhaps not all, Rebecca Horn's finger gloves. Nevertheless, in many accounts of the relationship to musical instruments, the idea is for any player to feel as one with their instrument, eventually, and after many years of practice. Likewise, the development of gestural interfaces for controlling sound or of new musical instruments is often predicated on models of incorporation, perhaps more than extension. So there's loads of examples of this. I've picked the Tisha Tsunami's ladies' gloves, which are like. There's many more examples. As a result, theoretical discussions of instrumentality by Philip Balkerson and others, and also empirical study of expressive gesture in musical performance often focus on the difficulty of determining exactly where the body ends and the instrument begins. But here it's rare that the piano is mentioned, hardly surprising considering its size and mechanics. We can't wrap our arms around it like we can a cello or guitar. We don't put any of it in our mouths. We can't feel a transference of breath through us into it. There's now plenty of evidence to show that we can expand and morph our body schema to encompass inanimate objects that we touch and control. And musical instruments are often cited as key examples. But not the piano. Instead, it's played at or on. That does not, however, stop pianists feeling a strong corporeal connection to the body of the instrument. A sense of touching sound, bringing it to life and shaping it with the hands and by extension the rest of the body. And pianists do feature significantly in the studies of instrumentalist bodies and particularly gestural expression that have emerged in recent years. Developments in embodied cognition are informed by and informing our understanding of our performance. At the same time, there are often problematic reductions, however understandable, in empirical attempts to unravel the relationship between musical intention and physical extension of the movements of the musical body. Many such studies seem to view the movements of musicians as directly enacting a mental conception of the musical content. So in this model, the performer works out their musical intentions and interpretative strategies, perhaps through a combination of score analysis, listening, conceptualization of the structure and expressive content, and then realizes this physically. Understanding musical gesture this way makes it theoretically possible to read back from what we see a musician do, analysing gestural content to musical intention by way of apparently neutral understanding of the music. We think we can explain gesture this way in terms of what the music does and how the musician projects that content bodily through the instrument. Such analysis facilitates an apparently more objective and empirical view of the relationship between instrument, musical material, expression, and hence meaning. And on one level, maybe that's what happens, but not always, and not just this. It seems a strangely Cartesian way of thinking mind and body, that seems to reflect only part of what goes on. In reality, performing intention is often far more complex than is acknowledged here. It's dynamic, always evolving, not pinpointed at any one moment in time, and it operates at different levels and in different modes. We think of it representing to ourselves and others in different ways at different times. 
what do I want to do here? What am I aiming for now that that phrase went differently to how I expected? What actually happened in that performance? Also though, it often takes place without explicit conceptualization, through apparently instantaneous embodied actions and reactions, what some would call intuition, though that's a dangerously loaded and contested term. Moreover, while the body does sometimes realise intentions, the instrument is not purely a means of self-expression, but as Catherine Woodard writes, a technology that shapes the self. The body is disciplined, not an unfettered tool of expression. As Dennis Peters says, music becomes a meaningful experience via bodily involvement. It doesn't just affect it as a consequence of cognitive acts, but rather meaning is created through bodily inaction, hence turning into cognitive acts. Beyond even this, we often seem to forget that embodied experience of the music can change or provide different versions at different times of the sense of musical shape, form, or expression. But simply, in playing music, we feel it in different ways at different times, and this is not separate from some conceptualized idea of what the music means, but is rather part of that understanding, formative of subsequent accounts. As Mary Hunter suggests, to acknowledge these changes can be disturbing to a sense of autonomy, to the sense that I, this performer with this body of this instrument, have something to say through this music. But at the same time, the urge to revisit music is surely predicated on a sense of development and change, of a dynamic relationship that takes on new meanings and is embodied differently in different contexts. Even the repetitive practice that is fundamental for musicians, although of course not just musicians, does not just facilitate technical dexterity, but sometimes also other forms of insight, <coughs> manifesting fragments of music as objects of embodied attention. As Bruce Brubeck, Brubeck notes, replaying is our practice, a structuring of time, and for the player, a structuring of life. Often it seems to me that accounts of the body and the instrument start by acknowledging some of these complexities, but subsequently move to a simpler interpretation of the relationship between the intention and, 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 intention and extension, in the eagerness to say something of apparently objective worth. In a practice-led artistic research inquiry, we lose objectivity, of course, but I'd argue that objectivity in this context is only ever a veneer, superficially reassuring, but masking the complexity. The wider significance of the piano is also relevant to my context today. On the one hand, we might argue that the instrument has declined in status, and certainly in prevalence, in domestic and educational environments in the West. At the same time, its rise in East Asia is phenomenal as a photo of a factory in Korea. And in many ways, in much of the West still, the piano is perhaps more intimately known than other instruments, still more commonly used than many for making and sharing music, but of course that varies across cultures. Culturally too, it carries a weight of associations stemming from its primacy in the Romantic tradition. The development of the grand piano is key to the 19th century evolution of the concept of absolute music and the idealised notion of the music of work. It's primarily through the development of the solo piano concept, initially thanks to Liszt, that Schopenhauer's notion of music as the highest art form, the unique manifestation of the will in itself, comes into the forefront. The lone pioneering virtuoso, using his extensive pianistic prowess, definitely his, and harnessing the formidable beast of an instrument, personifies this. The piano, in this sense, becomes a symbol of Western individualist humanism. The pianist often still acts within this mode today reproducing the idea of subjectivity sonically and physically that derives from 19th century ideals of expression, truth, authenticity, transcendence. And I would argue that we see this mode not just in extensions of the classical tradition, but also in many performances of avant-garde music, in jazz, in some performances of experimental music, in many singer-songwriter performances of the piano music. The piano then offers a particular context for understanding the instrumentality, artistic imaginings of self, and the interactions and divergences between embodied and aesthetically focused attention. And it's not surprising then that many artists, not just 
politicians have wanted to scrutinize the instrument, deconstructing, sometimes literally, the form it seems to carry. There's a few examples here. Uh, piano burnings, uh, um, sonic youth realization of the Dark Young piece, nailing down the keys of the piano, just boys, Japanese improviser burning his piano, some of Leah Lockwood's work. Piano street sculpture from South America, and again we're back to Rebecca Horn there. I think that one's called Concert for Anarchy, or something like that. That cultural and physical specificity is, as I'll discuss in a moment, something with which I struggle. But artists' relations to their tools, media, and the histories of their practices, and their reflexive scrutiny of the situated knowledge that is embedded in the interactions between these. Surely that is more broadly the stuff of much artistic research. <coughs> but about the pianist, given all that I've said, I might even ask sometimes whether I play the piano or the piano plays me. Where does the agency lie? Do I produce myself in and through performance or does the situation to the structures of performing produce me? Here I'm very obviously echoing the ways in which Judith Butler theorizes the performativity of gender. But the implications of these critical points, really quite familiar in other ways, are still little considered in music performance studies. Whose hands are these, anyway? As I ask in the piece you just heard an extract of. They're so much mine, they know so much of what I know, maybe more than I do. They can find notes, feel distance, decide on musical emphasis. But other people, teachers and composers, have modeled them too push them into peculiar shapes over and over until I can no longer say what's truly natural to them. And the most bizarre twists, turns and stretches feel somehow satisfying. The piece I performed on the piano at the start of this presentation was called Touch and Go. It was composed for me by Roger Marsh in 2014 through a process of collaboration. Just before this, at the very start, you heard a little extract from my recording of a piece called Cecine Parton Piano by the New Zealand-born composer Annie Lockwood, which was originally composed in 2002, um, and this new version uses a text that I wrote and recorded myself, and that was made in 2014. Both form, form part of a bigger project situated within an artistic research cluster called Performance, Subjectivity and Their Experimentation based at the Orpheus Research Centre in Music in Ghent, with much of my own work also taking place at the University of York in the UK. The project in part scrutinises the process of developing new collaborative pieces to performance, focusing the inquiry so as to consider the extent and nature of performer agency and the interaction of body and instrument in the space of performance, ultimately so as to explore the production of distributed intersubjectivity that often masquerades as an individual performance persona. The reason for performing Touch and Go today is that to my mind it exposes some of the complexities I've discussed, performs them, stages them through the act of performance maybe. The process of collaboratively making and practicing a piece comprised an exploration and a deepening understanding of the instrument of this body as more than a vehicle for realizing cognitized intentions, exposing its significance as modified through years of practice, through discipline in relation to the instrument, through the nature of training by other non-musical and embodied experience, by social and cultural experience, and by the demands of repertoire. Four composers have been involved in the project overall, in my part of and these are all people I've known and worked with for a very long time, which is important to the nature of the process. I've played their music over the years, and they each know me well as a performer, and they all work very collaboratively. They all know, but perhaps through different experiences and in different ways, that I love piano resonance. I love exploring the relationship between the performer and this strange machine, but I also feel somewhat disconnected from the concert traditions of the virtuoso solo piano tradition, and I increasingly find that I'm not alone in this. The composer brief was simply to, to develop a new piece for me that would explore, draw out, even exploit aspects of what they think of as my characteristics as a performer, 
and will bring other things into the piano scene, whether other sounds, objects, or activities. It's a purely artistic brief. As composers with very different approaches and varied experiences of working with me, this has inevitably produced new versions of my performing self, new representations of the piano player and her instrument. And after making these pieces, working collaboratively with the theatre maker Teresa Brayshaw and later on the filmmaker Wendy Kirkhop, I treated these pieces not as products, not as the final artistic work to be realised in performance, but as core elements in the subsequent devising of a large-scale performance project called Play of Piano. It's a little image from that which incorporates film, movement, other live performance actions in addition to piano performance. There's a few little images, I don't think these cross very clearly, but I'll give you some idea. As a result, the collaboratively produced compos compositions have become material in three senses. In the usual manner, for creative realisation by a pianist. Secondly, the material of the processes of making has been subject to reflection, which is both critical reflection and reflection in and through practice as part of research. And thirdly, the compositions, their processes of realisation and the processes of reflection, all fed into the further collaborative devising of playing piano. There is here a multi-layering of the iterative reflexivity that is perhaps characteristic of much artistic Search. Touch and Go, as a notated composition, was on the face of it the least collaborative element in this process. Much of my work with composers takes place in the rehearsal room, workshopping ideas, improvising and devising, often with a score generated only after performances as a consolidation of what happened, rather than the starting point for a realisation. But with this piece, Although it was me that initiated the brief, Marge then went off and composed independently and handed over a score. But I've worked with Marge for over 20 years. I've played many of his pieces, especially in the context of the music theatre ensemble that he founded. As a result, my hands recognise many of the shapes and patterns from playing other pieces of his over the years. The audible characteristics of his music are for me embodied. More than this, the more I've handled this music over so many years, the more my hands have become shaped and formed by the demands. Not just this music, of course, but the feeling of embodied recognition is tangible. I'm a pianist who plays all kinds of music that has for over 20 years, played more contemporary music than anything else. As such, the ways in which Marsh's music carries both similarities to and differences from that of other late 20th century and 21st century composition is manifested in my body as much as in my hands. Sorry, in my body as much as in the sound. This presumably works both ways. Marsh may have written the piece independently, but he did so with substantial experience of who I am on the piano, and with years of direct experience of what it might mean to give me something to do. What he produced is a conventional score notes and rhythms for execution, preceded just by a, a very brief scenario, a one-line scenario, about a process of discovery through the instrument. And the title hits at the hint of the precariousness of performance. When we consider that something might possibly work but might not, when we might, when we might succeed but might fail, even when someone very ill might or might not recover, we say the situation is touch and go, and that's how I think about performance. Much of Marsh's work is in the field of music theatre, but not all. And on the face of it, this piece might be a purely musical composition. He didn't specify any action at all, except that the hands might float between the first two chords. But while at the time of writing he had no idea of the final entity in which this piece might form a part to play a piano, he no doubt assumed, on the basis of past association and knowledge, and my current interest, that I do more than simply play the notes. None of that is specified in the score, though, it operates at a different level of interaction. In considering Aidan Evans' comments on the resistances that instruments present to performance, Stefan Oestergier proposes a reconfiguration of instrumental mastery into a focus on the meaningful negotiation of instrumental resistance. 
way in which a performer responds to the instrument is not simply a development of strategies to overcome this resistance, but rather a continual learning of how to play the dynamics of resistances, bit resistances. Within this piece, there's a strange combination of recognition in the familiarity of many of the shapes and patterns with respect to some of Marshall's other music, and estrangement in moments when the piece seems to actively disengage from those patterns in order to produce a contrived awkwardness, extravagantly difficult and possibly, possibly even in the stretches of the hands. Thematically, i.e. compositionally, this seems intended to produce a drama that contrasts moments in which the piano seems a strange and familiar object that requires a distorting and contorting of the body with other moments when the body and instruments seem reconciled, united when the notes flow. So the experience of performing this piece in this sense relates to Ostich's characterization of resistance. The process of practice became a continual learning not just to play, but also to play with the resistances of body and instrument. More significantly though, this process became generative. The more I focused on it, both reflectively, thinking about my realisation of the score, but also reflexively, considering in and through playing why and how I was practising as it quiet as I was, what I was doing with my body in relation to the instrument, with my pianistic technique, with my understanding of this piece, and how that derived from bigger questions outside of this piece, of bodies, pianos, the authority of composers and creativity, performers, and so on. The more the process afforded a different response, I started to focus on my playing gestures, to interrupt and freeze them, then to exaggerate and extend them, to generate an additional semi-choreographed, semi-improvised layer of gestural action, which foregrounded the kinds of bodily engagement already in process, that staged the explicit interaction of body, instrument, and sound. Perhaps also staged the performance embodied interception and interrogation of the composer's meaning making. Playing the resistance in this sense meant not just learning how to play the music in this context, but also how to play with sound, to playfully work in and through the touch and go situation of the piece, thereby opening up a space in which performer agency emerges. But the situation I've described with the piano concerns not just the dynamics of resistance between body and instrument. The contemporary piano set out here might be considered not just my instrument, but my habitus. Its history and repertoire, its cultural status in the context of performance, as much as its design, manufacture, and physical operation, forms, and is in part formed by, my set of embodied patterns for action and behaviour, physical, cognitive and cultural. Here I'm drawing on work by Stefan Oestesier, this time in collaboration with Kathleen Kussens, which takes the concept of habitus from Aristotle Mount Bourdieu as a dialectical system that both determines the behaviours of its participants and is shaped by them, and explores the ways in which an artistic habitus both enriches the expertise and potential of the artists, but also implicates a space of resistance be it between the musician's acts and the encounter materials, or between the musician's acts and the cultural space within which he or she interacts. Touch and go is simply a pianist but her instrument, in the conventional sense. There are no additional multimedia elements, no playing or modifications to the insides of the piano, no additional electronics or amplification. And pianists do make strenuous gestures when they play. There's a wide and diverse vocabulary of expressive gestures to which audiences have become accustomed, from the wildly flying arms of a langman to the deeply furrowed brow and hunched shoulders apparently necessary to the singer-songwriter's emotionally resonant portal accompaniments. I would argue then that in realising touching over the performance, there's a negotiation of instrumental and composerly but also cultural importance and resistance, an explicit embodied exploration of the tensions between the piano as seen and heard in the moment and the instrument's cultural backdrop, back the space of solo piano virtuosity, the roles of performer and composer, the roles of performer and instrument. 
Barbara Bolt, drawing on Judith Butler, notes that the artistic research process, quote, inaugurates movement and transformation through iterability. The reflexive performative act does something, has an effect on our perceptions, makes us look again, creates what Butler would call a deconstituting possibility, a space of new understanding that derives from the sim simultaneous use and disruption of the conventional, habitual, and reiterative. Estelle Barrett articulates research, artistic research as including processes that allow new objects of thought to emerge through cycles of making and reflection. A recognition of the generative potential of the ambiguity and the indeterminacy of the aesthetic object and the necessity for ongoing decoding, analysis and translation. And finally, the acknowledgement that instruments and objects of research are not passive, but emerge as co-producers and collaborative. So I focus today on something very specific, but I hope that in what I've said and done, in the attempt to stage performatively in some ways, to draw out and make more explicit the situation of performance making and the networks of conceptual and embodied knowledge and resistance at play, there's the possibility of forming a connection to exactly what Barrett describes here. Thank you.